Welcome to BTI, that's Bible Training Institute. We open the scriptures every week, line upon line, precept upon precept, here a little and there a little. Study with us and learn how to know God as a close, intimate, and personal friend, and learn what is soon to come upon this world. We can look around at the world, and we can look at the handwriting that exists in every event that we see in the nations, and we can see why we should be praying for that rain. Last week, we ended by explaining that the events of the first week of January brought us to the brink of a what? Civil war. Does that mean anything for us prophetically, yes or no? We found that the civil war happens just before the time of trouble. Remember that? We said that just before this time of trouble, the civil war takes place. We looked at the three principal time frames that Jeremiah spoke of. What were the three principal time frames? You should know it from memory now, from Jeremiah 12. What were the three principal time frames? Time of the footmen, the time of the horses, and the time of the good, the swelling of Jordan. Three principal time frames. Now tell me, where does the time of the footmen fall? Is it right here? No. Right here? No. Where? When Jesus went into the most holy place, a transition took place and took us to the time of the footman right there. Question. What about the time of the horses? Where would I find that? So the time of the footman takes us from 1844 to the passing of a what? National Sunday law. The time of the footman takes us from what? The national Sunday law. Excuse me, horses. Time of the horses takes us from the national Sunday law until what? What signals the close of probation? What happens? Michael stands up. What does that mean? Michael stands up. What does that mean? He has finished his work as a priest. Michael stands up. So the time of the horses takes us from the son-in-law being passed to the time of Michael stand up. Now that happens in heaven. No one will see Michael stand up. But there is an event on earth that lets us know that Michael has stood up. There's an event on earth that lets us know that Michael has stood up. When we see the first plague fall, we know Michael's already st stood. You know that the plagues will not fall until Michael finishes his work. So when we see the plagues falling on the earth, we know that Michael has already stood up. Now, my brothers and sisters, the universal sunny law will pass here. Now, when then is the time of the swelling of the Jordan? From the time that Michael stands up all the way during the what? Plagues. How many plagues? The seven last plagues. What is going to deliver us out of the swelling of the Jordan or the time of trouble? What's going to deliver us out of that? Second. The second coming of Jesus Christ. This time of the footman takes us from now. We're at the last portion of the time of the footman. It'd be like getting ready to run a marathon and we haven't even run a race yet. <laughs> we have some last little bit of getting ready to do in order to be able to keep up with the horses. But I told you last time. If we're not getting ready now, if we're not really preparing now, how are we going to be ready then? If we're failing to do everything that we need to do right now in the time of the footmen, how are we going to be able to keep pace with the light? It will be impossible. Now, my brothers and sisters, this is why it's so significant. We found out that civil war takes us right to that point. Now, should we be praying for rain? Yes or no? Yes. Now, the line of preparation, I want you to see a line of preparation. Uh, Joshua says something. I'm not going to turn there right now. We'll probably look at it before we close. But Joshua says something. In the book of Joshua, he said, just as they were getting ready to go into the promised land, and he was strengthening his people, he said something. He said, now, I don't know what it seems right for you all to do. He says, but as for me and... Now, notice how he said that. As for me and what? My house. My house. We're going to serve the Lord. Now, I want us to understand something. Do you want to prepare, yes or no? Yes. Now, in order to prepare... We have to understand the line of preparation. Let me put this up. This says, as inauguration nears, this is before the inauguration of the 20th, concern of more violence, that's what? Gross. Gross. Well, all the violence is over now. Am I right? No. <laughs> now, watch what he says. What happened on January 6th, this past week, uh, Wednesday, might not be the end of the insurrection, but the... Not the end, but the what? Beginning. Now, you got to understand something. What happened in 2021 was the beginning of something. Now, someone said beginning. What could it be? I want to let you know. I'm going to write this. It's the beginning of what? The Civil War. That's what happened. Now, somebody said, oh, 
how, how could this ever be? We just on the brink. But, but do you know the Civil War, the first Civil War that started in 1861, that Civil War didn't really start in 1861. That was the acting out of something that had been developing for at least 10 years. Something happened, and you'll find something happened in the 1850s that really brought America to the place in 1861 where they were so divided. We're not going into that now. That's not our purpose. But something happened in the 1850s would, would tell us there was a period of years that developed the conditions that made the open, outright civil war possible. So if we're waiting for the civil war to start immediately right now, we, we don't understand. So that means that something must happen prior to the open right out civil war that begins to help us to see that we're getting closer and closer. Now, I'm going to tell you something. Something happened in 2021 that's just the beginning of an ideology that is going to get worse and worse until it actively explodes and everybody's going to say, yes, we are in the civil war. It says we need to be concerned, but we at this point have, have to be wiser to what's possible. We have to prepare accordingly. Now, notice we say we have to do what? Prepare. We have to prepare. Now, he didn't know how to prepare. He's talking about a totally different uh, uh, perspective. But he said we need to prepare. He's right about that. Those who fail to prepare, what are they doing? Preparing, preparing to fail. Yeah. Let me say that again. Those who fail to prepare are preparing. But they are preparing to... Now, my question is, what are you preparing for? Are you preparing to succeed or are you preparing to fail? What are we getting our homes ready for? Are we getting our homes ready to succeed or our homes ready to fail? Now, this says, the F, uh, Washington Post to FBI agents are investigating whether some of the Capitol rioters intended not just to disrupt the certification of the Electoral College votes, but also to capture, our, uh, capture or what? Kill lawmakers. Well, they would never do that. Is that right? Civil war trends on Twitter as Trump supporters storm U.S. Capitol. It says Washington, D.C. is currently on lockdown. Trump, tro Trump pro protesters are breaching the Capitol building and civil war is what? Trending on Twitter. What does it mean trending? What does that mean when it says it's trending? That's what's become popular. That's what everybody starts talking about now. Wh why in the world? Now you go back six years ago, and ten years ago. When we were talking about this, people were saying, you know, what? you know, we talked about this 10 years ago. You know, what people were saying that would never happen in America. That happened before, but not, not in America, but not now. It's trending. It says thousands of people gathered in Washington, D.C. on Wednesday morning to protest Congress counting of the electoral votes to confirm president-elect Joseph Biden. The protests quickly turned into one requiring a citywide curfew as President Trump supporters began storming the Capitol, putting the vote on what? Pause. Now watch. Many on Twitter are sharing their remarks of disbelief as well as believing that this could be the start of the next civil war. They've been saying, it says, here's some, what some people have been saying. I'm only going to look at two of them right now. It, it, it get more, 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 some of them, was, it was crazy. But it says, they've been saying they would do this for what? Years. Years. Threatening a second civil war and violence and no one listened because it was just where? It was just online. January 6th, it wasn't online. It was up close and personal. It says, look what it says. It says, this is currently your country. The civil war isn't what? Now, friends, this is not the end of something. This is only the beginning. beginning. Now, what you and I know is what this is going to bring. What's, what do you think that this is going to bring? Yes. This says the U.S. is heading for a what? Constitutional, Constitutional crisis. crisis. This is what this is headed for. The Civil War of the 1860s brought America to a constitutional crisis back then. It's bringing us to another constitutional crisis, but they don't know what it is. It says the right has captured the Supreme Court, but has lost the battle for public opinion. It says this crisis would arise from a tension that has existed where? Throughout what? Namely between the courts and a system of democracy that gives ultimate power to who? Talk to me, somebody. People. Now, you better understand this. In order to get a son in law, the popular, it must become a popular demand. The majority of the people must begin demanding for the passing of a son in law. 
So just what we see a demand for is going to grow. It says a constitutional crisis properly understood as a turning point that might lead to, what's the next word? Collapse or transformation of the system has not yet occurred. It says, but such a crisis does not appear increasingly, but such a crisis does, how? Now appear increasingly likely. Not only likely, it's getting ready to happen. It says, I'm not talking about the election. Though that could produce a constitutional crisis if the outcome is close or in the unlikely event that Trump somehow refuses to do what? We finally know he left office. But that's not even what the crisis is about. It says, rather, I'm referring to a, the, a crisis that a, could occur even if Trump what? Which he did. It says, this crisis would arise from a tension that has existed throughout where? In other words, Trump did not produce the crisis and Trump cannot end the crisis. It's much larger than that. What exists today is a crisis developing over the Constitution. Then it shows us the two times that America was brought into the greatest constitutional crisis in its history. The Civil War, number one. The New Deal, number two. But then it tells us that there is a what? Why you would think that they were the spirit of prophecy. <laughs> They're speaking of a coming crisis. But they can't tell you what it is. Now watch what the prophet says. Volume 5, 7, 11. We just read this in our family devotion. Now look at what it says. It says a great what? Crisis awaits the people of God. Now when it says awaits the people of God, who is it talking about? The church. The remnant church. It says a crisis awaits where? Those are two different classes, but a crisis is coming to both. A crisis to the church, a crisis to the but the event is going to, the same event is going to bring a crisis to both. It says, the momentous struggle of all the ages is where? Yeah. Just before us. Now think about this. Now the prophet is saying this in the 1880s. She says, events which for more than 40 years we have been upon the authority of the prophetic word declared to be impending are what? Now taking place Where? Now, listen, listen. The prophet is saying this in the 1880s. Now, look at what's happening. Now, I want you to understand what's happened. For 40 years, since 1844, God began to un uh, open up this truth to us. When we went into the time of the footman, God's began outlining this truth. For 40 years into the 1880s, the prophet says, now, what we've been talking about for 40 years is now doing what? Taking place. Now, somebody said, but you and I are in 2021. How could it be happening then? But you don't understand something. Revelation 7 tells us that the winds of strife were actually held back. They were getting ready to blow up on the earth and God held them back. That's what the prophet is talking about. Now, do you understand that since the 1880s, that a crisis in the Constitution has never brought us to a place of amending the Constitution like we are since the 1880s until we got back into the crisis of revolving around 2019, 2020 and 2021. That exactly where we were in the 1880s before God extended probation is exactly where we are again. So you're going to find that everything the prophet wrote then is happening now. Do you know that there was a, a Sunday law that was put before the Constitution for the Congress? And it was put before the bill. It's called the Senator Blair Bill in the 1880s. And it was getting ready to be passed nationally. But God sent a messenger by the name of 18 Jones. And under the inspiration of God, went to Congress and talked down by the power of God the passing of that Sunday law. Had it been passed, the church was not ready. You and I weren't even born. But my brothers and sisters, we are right back at that place again. And God is, the Bible never speaks of a second probation. Never speaks of a second extension of probation. Only that one in Revelation 7, no more. Which means when we come back to the same point, no extension, the limit will be reached. It says... Events which for more than 40 years have been upon the authority of the prophetic word declared to be impending are what? Now. Taking place. Now we can come back and put in now 2021 because we're right back at that same place. Already the question of amendment to the Constitution restricting liberty of conscience has been what? Urged upon the legislators of the nation. Now let's read this together. The question of enforcing Sunday observance has become one, not of state interests, but one of what? national interests and importance. We now, now the prophet said in the 1880s, we don't well know today. Now they knew, they well knew then, we don't well know today. You can go up in the church and never hear of a Sunday law. But this says, we well know what the result 
of this movement will be. The result will be a passing of a Sunday law. Now, look at this now. Let's read this together. But are we ready for the issue? Now, this is the real issue. Now, now I want to ask you a question. The issue, it says, are we ready for it? What issue will the sin law bring? Because we, we, we well know, but we don't well know today. The, we should well know, but we don't well know today. What issue will the sin law bring? We're going to find out it's going to bring a physical issue and it's going to bring a spiritual issue. The crisis is going, is going to be both physical and spiritual and the preparation. The preparation must be both what? Physical and spiritual. Now I want to ask you a question. What, talk to me now. What well, the national sin law, what, what issue and crisis will the national sin law bring to us physically? Loss of property, imprisonment, torture. Tell me some more. Death. Life itself. Do you think that, that, do you think that we're physically prepared? Do you know that most people right now, if you were being tortured right now, I mean, can you imagine somebody attacking, grabbing my child? I'm telling you something, I'm not, I'm not ready for that yet. I'm praying. I, I say, Lord, you have to help me because see, if somebody grab my child now, I'm going to grab them. <laughs> and my, my teacher said, look, he said, look, if you, if, if, when Lot, he said, when, when Lot, when, 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 when Lot said, he's going, you know, the, the angels came and said, uh, he's going to throw out his women. He said, my teacher said, no, I wouldn't throw out my daughter. You know, Lot said, he, he said, take my daughters. They'd never know men. My teacher said, look, I'll take out my shotgun. That's what I would, and that's what I would have stuck out. But he was saying, well, I need to get some more development. That's what he was saying. He needs some more character of Christ. I'm telling you, I need some more character of Christ. Because somebody right now, I would make sure they didn't have a hand. But do you know when persecution starts, we, we cannot respond this way. Now, why we should give our lives for the protection of our family. We cannot respond in a hateful, uh, retaliatory way or we'll never be ready for the coming of the Lord. So my brothers and my sisters, we are not ready for this. Can you imagine seeing our little boy? I mean, can, can you imagine, Brother Tony? I mean, Brother Tony, he's been working out, you know. <laughs> and somebody come out and grab hold of Micah and Selah and Shiloh and expect you to smile in their face. Come on, Brother Smokey. Brother Bill, what do you do when you see this? All of us, Brother Tim, I mean, this is not something that we want to do, to, to face but you know that Jesus was able to take it and while he was uh, protective of his people, it wasn't by him pulling out a gun and shooting somebody. Jesus protected his disciples, but it wasn't by him going over to them and saying, now, now you give me my sword, I'm going to knock you out. But he protected them in a different type of method. And we have to do the same thing. We're not ready for this. They see your wife. I remember hearing a story from a missionary friend of mine. He said they were out in somewhere in, in the mission field in another country and a group of gangs grabbed hold of all the missionaries. Gangs, violent gangs, took hold of all the missionaries. And we're he's telling this story. His, his, his family and friends were, were, were part of this situation. He, his wife and his, himself weren't physically there, but many of his uh, workers. And right when they were there, the gang took the wives of the missionaries and rape them. You say, what do you do? You stop being a missionary now? So I don't think we're ready to understand there is a physical, something has to happen. Spiritual preparation. Now physical, my brothers and sisters, there's going to be more. But before that type of violent attack in its fullness, Satan said, I I don't even believe you're going to make it that far. You know what he believes is going to cause the majority of seven Adventists to give up and the world in the physical approach is something called economy. What? To control your economy. The Bible says that no man might buy or sell. That means that if we're going to go through this physically, we have to have an economy that's different than the one we're operating on right now. And by the grace of God, before it's over with, right at this little church, we're going to need to start talking. And it's going to take more than Sabbath. We're going to have to start surrendering some of our more days here than just Sabbath. Because, see, in order to get ready, there needs to be some physical things we're doing that can bring a new economy into existence. And, and by God's grace, I want us to bring it into existence right here at this little church. Do you want to be in a position where you don't have to buy or sell? 
to be able to go through this? Then we, that means we've got to do some studies past just on Sabbath. Are you following? Some of the things that we need to do physically, we can't talk about in detail on the Sabbath. What would about a Sunday? Wouldn't that be good sometimes we can come together on a Sunday? And get together as a family and encourage each other? And be able to talk about some physical things that we can do to band together, to be able to do something, to put us in a position that the Bible speaks of to get ready for this crisis. We've got to advance what we're doing right now. So there's going to be a physical preparation, ability to help us when no man can buy or are we ready for this issue? Yes or no? You saw what happened when the uh, when the pandemic took place. You saw we weren't ready. Am I right? But we can't stay in this position. Now, we have some plans that we need to talk about where we can do with everybody or nobody that can help us get through this crisis. But now there's also a spiritual preparation. Now, my brothers and sisters, what is the spiritual preparation that's necessary to be ready for the issue that a son in law brings? What's the spiritual preparation? CIP. What does it look like? What is, if somebody says, oh, I have a CIP right now. Well, there's a way to demonstrate if we have a CIP. That, that somebody must come to a place where they're in a sinless state. A what? Sinless state. A sinless state. This is the issue because when judgment passes from the dead to the living, we cannot now try to get out of sin. It's too late if we're not out of sin. So that means that this son-in-law is going to bring an issue that's going to eliminate the people of the remnant church from getting, being brought back to the sinless state, which means if we're going to do it, we have to do it when? Now, now and in the time of the footmen, before the time of the horses. So my brothers and sisters, these two great things need to be going on right now, physical and spiritual preparations, so that by God's grace, we can be ready for the crisis. Now, how are we going to get ready? Now, you know that a whole world, that God wants this message to go to the entire world, but we'll never, right now, this is us, here's the world. We'll never be ready by going to the world and trying to get them ready. You know why? Is the world's economy getting ready to collapse, yes or no? How can we go to the world to help their broken, collapsed economy and we don't have an economy? How can we do it? So my brothers and sisters, we cannot give what we don't have. That means that prior to us being able to help the world physically or spiritually, something must happen to us. Am I right? So it's before the world, you've got to be able to reach your own nation. Your what? Before you can reach your own nation, you've got to be able to reach your own state. Before you can reach your own state, you've got to be able to reach your own community. Am I right? How are we going to help the world and we can't even help our community? What community are we in right here? What community is this? Richland. This is Richlands. Now, do you know that before we're going to be able to help the world in the crisis, we should be able to help the community of Richland physically and spiritually? And by God's grace, he's laid some plans on me, too, of what we can do right here in this, this community to help it physically. To have people just begging to become a part of this church. But, but brothers and sisters, but before we can do that, there's a church. How are we going to help the community if we can't even help our own church? Not just spiritually, but our own church how? Physically. I mean, look at our sister Teresa. What does she need right now? Transportation. We should be able to help that. We should be able to solve that problem as a church where she doesn't have to depend on a stimulus check from a government. That's an insult to us. That she has to go to the government to take care of her. What would that lead a person to do when the same law is passed? If they've been going to the government to get stimulus, what's going to happen when the same law passed? Someone says, oh, well, we don't have to worry about it. As long as the government takes care of it, we don't have to worry about that. Is that right? Is that how God feels? Or should we be able to take care of our own? Yes or no? We should be able to do something about that. And by God's grace, as long as we're here, we're going to bring something to existence where we can take care of every problem that exists among us as a church. Amen. Once we can do something like that to take care of our church, we'll be in a position where we can arrange ourselves to help the community in which we belong. But if we can't help the church ourselves, we can't help the community. We're just fooling ourselves. But now, my brothers and sisters, someone says, well, then let's rush to fix this. But guess what? We're not going to be able to help the church until we can do something right here for our own one. Oh. So 
So the line of preparation starts. Where does the line of preparation starts? Just where Joshua said. You know what he said? As for me and my what? House. We shall serve the Lord. Now if we start doing that and begin to apply these principles that we're going to be studying here at the church that will help us both physically and spiritually, God can put us in a position where we can help the world. I want to do it. What do you say? Amen. We don't have much time. And so by God's grace, before we get back into our study, we're not going to be able to finish all this, of course, in one day. We're laying a foundation and we're studying piece by piece, but we've got to pick up quickly because there's a physical and a spiritual work and it cannot happen unless we go to God and say, Lord, no more playing. There has to be advancement. The time of the footman is about to change. I want to progress. Do you want to progress? Yes. I mean, can you imagine we can come to a place where we don't need the government? We don't need man. We don't need to be able to buy or sell that all of our physical and spiritual needs can be taken care of. But before we do, we're going to have to understand how to get this rain. And so we want to come to our final uh, part of this study on the rain. But before we do, can we reverently kneel as we approach the Lord in prayer? Heavenly Father, we're so thankful that you are so merciful that you never send a crisis and allow a crisis without first sending a message that will teach us how to prepare. Before the flood, you sent Noah with a message. Before the destruction of Solomon and Gomorrah, you sent Lot and the angels with a message. Before the destruction of Jerusalem, you sent the disciples with a message. Before the first coming of Christ, you sent John the Baptist with a message. And before the second coming of your dear son, you have sent three angels flying in the midst of heaven with a most wonderful message that will show us how to prepare physically and spiritually for the final crisis that is just before us. And Father, we're not ready. And the only way we can reach the world is that we must follow the chain, the, the line of preparation that starts with our hearts in our home. But Lord, it's not just an ideological way. There's some physical things that we need to be doing differently. There are some spiritual things that we need to be doing differently in order to prepare us for this time. And we're asking that you would open up our minds, our eyes, our hearts, that instead of resisting, that we may yield to your Holy Spirit to get this experience. Father, as we enter our study today, we sense your presence. We recognize that you are here. Be with the children. Be with the adults. Be with our families. Do something for us that only your Holy Spirit can do. Pour out the rain upon us right now, dear God. Give us what we need to satisfy our souls. Abide with us now, we pray. Remove every distraction. For we ask all of this in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's take our Bibles and turn to Revelation chapter 12. We're going to the last book of the Bible. Now, I'm ready to study. Are you ready to study? Amen. Good. Let's go to Revelation 12. We want to pick up where we left off. Now, I was getting ready to take us somewhere. I was getting ready to take us to uh, the next section. Remember, last week was supposed to be the final study of the latter rain uh, in its basic understanding. But when I got there and I was getting ready to move on, the Holy Spirit reminded me of something. I'm going to tell you what the Holy Spirit reminded me of. This is Gospel Workers 168. We were getting ready to move into the shaking. Into the what? Shaking, shaking and the sealing. But as I got ready to do that and I was pre preparing, I, I'm telling you, I was almost finished the, uh, having it prepared for us. And the Holy Spirit convicted my heart, Sister Debbie. This is what he said to me. Let's read this together. It says, do not think when you have gone over a subject once that your hearers will retain in their minds all that you have presented. <laughs> That's what the Holy Spirit said to me. I said, okay, Lord. I said, but Lord, I want to go into, we're we getting behind, we're getting behind, we're getting behind. He said, but, but where are you going? <laughs> I mean, if you present everything and, nobody, and we don't understand it together and can't do anything about it, where are we going? Where are we going? How are we preparing? We're not preparing. So it says that your hearers will retain in their minds all that you present. Let's read this together. There is what? Danger, not only of a Sunday law, but there is danger of what? Passing too rapidly from point to point. Person can't carry with you. The footmen move to the horses. You can't follow. We can't keep pace. It says our speakers should what? Remember that the subjects they are presenting may be new, maybe not to everybody, but new to what? Some of their hearers. Therefore, the what? 
In other words, you may not repeat every little thing, but the main things, the principal points should be gone over one time and then keep going. Should be gone over how? Again and again. What's the connotation of that? Just two times, that's the connotation of that when it says go over it again and again? What's the connotation of that? You repeat it until what? Until finally it's able to be retained. And so you will see that many times in order to be able to go forward, we have to go what? Backwards. Have you ever been stuck before? Yes. It's a science to getting out of a place of being stuck. That you got to go back and sometimes we go too fast. Sometimes you have to actually go slower than normal if you're stuck. Am I right? If you go too fast, the wheels start spinning and lose traction. But if you back up and then go a little bit slower the next time, slower, you can get out. In our church, we're in trouble right now. Do you know that 99% of us have no idea what's taking place? God is trying to prepare people so that not only we hear messages, but that we understand. You know, it's possible to hear something and be able to even quote a right answer and still not understand. I have no desire for that in this church. We're not just preaching. We want to go to the Bible in our classes. We're studying Bible Training Institute, BTI. And so we're going back and I want to make sure that we can understand it because we are almost at the point where we want to put everything into practice. I want our children to understand this. Do you hear what I said? Oh, our children have to be ready for this. Yes or no? Yes. I want Maya to understand it. To be able to go back to her Bible. I want Shiloh to be able to understand. Even Selah can understand it. She's resting right now. It's okay. She's resting. Okay. But even she can begin to understand it little by little. Micah can understand it. He can read from the Bible. All of us can be made to understand this. Youth and adults, because God is going to take youth and adults to do the work, but we've got to start ready and training our families. Am I right? Even if it feels like, well, it doesn't seem like they're getting it. It doesn't seem like they want to. Don't give up. Don't get discouraged. Keep going. If so, it doesn't seem like they're, they're listening, it doesn't seem like they want to listen, it doesn't seem like they're interested, keep going, keep going. And pray God, give me a give more wisdom of how to interest them. Give me more wisdom of what to do. Keep going as a family because it starts here. If we can't interest our family and our children, how are we going to interest the children of the community? How are we going to interest the adults of the community? If we can't do something to prepare us, we'll never prepare anybody else. Are you following me? So we've got to go over this again and again. Are you ready? Yes or no? Now, you remember Revelation 12, we were studying something called, you remember what we were studying? Someone says, oh, they were playing chess. No, we weren't studying chess. <laughs> what were we studying? The game, the game of life. Remember those quotations on the game of life? Satan is playing the game of life for souls. We looked at that. Probation is about to close. Or what's the enemy doing? The enemy is playing the game of life for every soul. We talked about the game of life that was being played. Now, my brothers and sisters, I want to back up to that game of life a little bit. And I want to then go forward to understand some more. And we're going to dig into some things we had not studied about the latter rain, but that are essential for us to understand. Now, let's go to Revelation chapter 12. And when you get there, let me know by saying amen. amen. Revelation 12, we want to pick up in verse 17. Revelation chapter 12 and verse 17. Let's read that together. All together, what does the Bible say? And the dragon was wroth with the woman. Now here's a, a description of that. The dragon was wroth with the woman. Now who is the dragon? Satan. Satan. The Bible says that in verse 9. Who is this woman? She represents the church. Let's continue to read. It says, the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make, not play, but he went to make what? War. So somebody said, I thought he was a game. I'm saying war, you're not playing. <laughs> so why is it called a game? But you know, there's such, there's such a thing called war games too. You know that right? The game of war. That's a game. It's the natural end result of all games as well. That's a whole different story. But it says, uh, went to make war with the, talk to me somebody, with the what? Amen. Remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. So the Bible says that Satan went to make war on the woman or the church. Now the church was the, that, tw that woman that was there with the 12 stars. This was the early church, the early apostolic church. But the Bible shows us that this was going to take time, this war. How do we know? Because it says, not only did he make war with this early church, but it says, and with the remnant of her. So that this church was going to have an offspring. That there's going to be a church like the early church in the last days that's going to be called the remnant. How are we going to identify them? Well, two were given us in this verse. There were others, but in this verse too. How are you going to identify that church? Because their churches today are all the churches the remnant, yes or no? Is the, Bab is the, is the uh, uh, Catholic church the remnant? No. no, they're not the remnant. Is the Baptist church the remnant? No, they're not the remnant. 
Is the Pentecostal church the remnant? No, they're not the remnant. And the Bible tells that every one of these churches will tell you they're not the remnant. And you say, what do you mean? Well, I'll show you in a moment. But does God have children in these churches? Yes or no? Yes. He does. And all, in fact, many of the majority of churches, uh, Christians are in these churches. But now listen. God identified this remnant church. Last line. The remnant of her seed, which do what? Talk to me. Keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Number one, this remnant must keep the commandments of God. Am I right? Now, all these other churches, what would they tell you about the Ten Commandments if you ask them? Now, do, 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 are they shy about telling you that? No. They'll tell you openly. So they're telling you, really, we're not the remnant. Because the remnant keep the commandments of God. So they're telling us, you, they're not the remnant. And not only do they keep the commandments of God, but the Bible says they have the testimony of Jesus Christ. What is the testimony of Jesus? Revelation 19.10 says that the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of so that church must have the spirit of prophecy. This, this little book that I'm reading from, the spirit of prophecy. We'll study it more fully another time. But the spirit of prophecy has to be there. They have to have it. Now the devil wants to take these two things out of our hands. He wants to attack them from our church. Now, my question is, why is the devil not making war with all these other churches? Now, does he like every other church? Not necessarily. They are Come on, brother. <laughs> you must have woke up early this morning, Brother Bill. <laughs> he's ready to preach. Now give him a microphone. <laughs> I'm telling you, he's getting ready for the loud cry. <laughs> All of us, this is why we're here. The, now, now, don't get me wrong. Are there sincere Christians in every one of these churches? Yes. But the system that controls the churches are in the devil's hand already. Babylon is what the Bible calls it. Well, I want to ask you a question. You answer, you're making me excited. Praise the Lord. <laughs> So now that you answered that one correctly, now I have more hope that you answer this one correctly. <laughs> now, the second question now. Second question, Brother Micah. Second question. Second question. Why does Satan hate the remnant church so much? Oh, Sister Davis, Mother Davis. Because we keep the commandments of God. And we have a testimony. Very good, but there's some more to it. Very good. Very good. That was, that, that's right on point. But there's some more to it. My, Micah? Because we're not on his side. Good, Micah. There's some more to it. Very good, but Micah. I'm telling you, you're getting ready for a loud cry. Sister Melissa? I cannot, yeah, yeah, no, 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 she, you know, you used, used to play a game called uh, 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 Hucker Bucker Beanstalk. Uh, Y'all know that, but, but, <laughs> but anyway, in, in, in the game, when the person, when you get closer and closer to the thing, they say, you're getting hot, you're getting hotter, you're getting hotter. Yeah. But anyway, so you, you get, you, sister, you, you're almost on fire right now. <laughs> so what you said is directly a point, but, but, but I want to say it in a different way. So you're explaining, you're explaining the right thing from the right principle, but there's some more uh, of what that suggests of why Satan hates us. But that's, you're right on the point. You heard what the sister said? She said that the remnant church had been given the understanding that we must be brought to a sinless state. And then we can then tell the world of the necessity of getting on a sinless state. And then how? Because it's not enough to know we must be sinless and don't know how. Am I right? So in this church, we've got to learn not only that we can be, but we need to learn to understand what? How can we be? Because just knowing we can be and don't know how, that would actually... Uh, 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 that would actually uh, discourage us <laughs> to know that we can and then don't know how because we keep failing and failing and failing. But if we can learn that we can and through Jesus Christ how we can, well, that brings encouragement. It will prove Satan a lie. Uh, uh, so, so give me a little more because you, you're, you're coming down the right road. That's now, yeah, you, you're almost there, sister. Bring, bring us through. <laughs> so why? Now, let me, let, me, let me back up the question again because you're right there. So now, why? We found out why Satan is not really fighting other churches so much. He already got them deceived on his side. Why does Satan hate our church? You're right there. Why does Satan hate the remnant church? <laughs> You're right there, sister. Just bring it to the birth. <laughs> bring it out. Well, Satan's issue in heaven wasn't his issue in heaven below. Yes, 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 yes. Now, see, you're going deep. You're going deep, sister. You're going deep. 
I want you to stay just a little bit, stay on the surface a little bit more. <laughs> but you're right, you're right, Sister Debbie. The church is the only hope left. Amen. They're the, they're the only hope left. Now, see, you, you took us into it, and that's right. You, this is what you were saying. And this is what you were saying? The, S Sister Shirley, come on. I like this. Now, my blood flow. I like this. Come on. Yes. Now listen, sister, 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 Charlotte. Oh man, this is good. Man, the Holy Spirit is here. This is good. <laughs> this, is, this is so good. Ma Mommy. Ma this is good. This is, I'm telling you, this is, this is good. I, something, something's happening. The Holy Spirit's working with us. Now, now listen. I said, Brother Bill, start this thing off. That's what <laughs> Now listen, 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 listen. The Seventh-day Adventist Church. I'm abbreviating. What's that? That's the remnant. Bible calls it remnant, but we'll find out that why the name Seventh-day Adventist is the only name you can get to the remnant. It's the only name. Our name, we didn't make up. Our name was literally biblical and was given by God himself. But we'll come back to that. Now, but the Seventh-day Adventist Church is the only hope. Sister Melissa was telling us why. She was giving us some of the details, which is right on the point. But they're the only hope. And as our sister said, every other denomination teaches... Then in 31 AD, when Jesus bought us, that the game is over. So what about the war then? What about the war? So every other church is teaching us that the war is what? The war is finished and all we're doing is a victory lap. All we're doing now is a victory lap, just wasting time, just letting time run out. I mean, you go to, some church, to another church and say, why didn't Jesus come back yet? You say, you saved? Yeah, I've been saved, I've been saved 10 years ago. You saved, I've been saved 10 years ago. You saved, I've been smoking, killing, drinking, beating, I'm in adultery, everything going on, but you've been saved. But all of this is going on, and, and I say sincerely because many sincere souls believe this. And it's not because they're trying to fight God. They just have never been taught that which is true. So we don't condemn that mind. We want to lovingly, tenderly pick up that mind and educate that mind. But we can't educate if we don't understand. And the answer is not, okay, the cross is not important. We need something more than the cross. No, 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 no. The cross is the heart of the entire program. Yes. Yet the cross is not the end. It is only the beginning. beginning. You have to understand the rest of the story. All right, my brother? Satan hates this church because he knows that we know the truth, that we have to come to this. Yes. Right? And if he can keep us from getting there, he wins the he game. He wins the game. Now, see, what you said, look, somebody would say you were a heretic for saying that, but is that Bible truth? Bible. Now, we may not have said that before, but as we dug through the Bible from Genesis to Revelation, we find out that this generation, everything in the great controversy depends on this last generation. Yes. And not on the dead. Mm. The dead can't do anything. Right. It depends on what? The, the living. living. They, without us, us cannot be made perfect. They can't be brought back to perfection. So all of this and this final generation is hanging upon this living. And guess what? 99% of those alive have no idea what we're talking about. Christian church, you know they bless their little hearts. They know they don't know. And the remnant of the Christian church, seven of minutes, I say it respectfully, humbly, but not more than 99% of us really understand what we're talking about right now. So we've got to get now, and there has to be a revival of reformation under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. So Satan hates us because he understands that we are the only hope through Jesus for the entire world. He knows that, that we are the only ones that know that the war is not over. The war is still going on. That war in heaven that started in verse 7 is still going on in Revelation 12, 17. No, no one else knows this. Now, my brothers and sisters, we found out something very significant. Look, let's read this together. Great Controversy 510. Let's read it together. It says, from the days of... That's the beginning. To our own time, our great enemy has been exercising his power to oppress and to destroy. He is now preparing for his what? Last campaign against the church. Now, we have to go in and, 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 and later on, not this study, but later on, when we get a little bit closer, we got to dig into how is he making this campaign? How is he doing it? What's his advertising agency? What's his method? How's he doing this? All who seek to follow Jesus will be brought into conflict with this relentless what? Foe. And so in this war, this is what's happened. Now, remember I told you I was going to show you a picture. Remember as I told you? This is the real picture right here. Now, this is a, they, they colored it. I'm going to show you the real picture, but they colored it. But this is the real description of the picture. Here in, in, in their chest, they have more uh, men that look more realistic than their chests of today. But here's the man. You see his little face here? You see that little smirk right there? 
You see him? What does he look like? The game of life. One more move. Here's the real picture. The real brass. The one more move story of Paul Morphy. That was the, that, that was the chess player. That was his name, Paul Morphy. And the Moritz Reese painting. You pronounce it Reese. The, the Moritz Reese painting. This is the, the famous painting right there. Right there. This is the game of life. Now, what is this? Talk to me. What is this? When do we get to halftime? When do we get to halftime? Now, why is it halftime? If nearly 4,000 years of human history passed off, and there are only 6,000 years of human history, wouldn't halftime be 3,000? Why, why is it not 3,000? Halftime is not based on time. <laughs> halftime is based on what? Events. So we're going to find out that what happened in 31 AD is that half of the events in the plan of redemption had transpired at that time. Thank you. Half of the events had transpired. Half. The first half had to be done in the, on the earth. The last half has to be done where? Yeah. Who does the first part of the work? The lamb. Who does the second half of the work? The priest. But who is the lamb? Jesus. Who is the priest? Jesus. So he does it all, but he does it in two halves. Just like any other team must do it. Am I right? All right. Here's halftime. Now, I'm going to ask you a question. Please help me let, me. let me know you know. See, this is foundational that we got to understand. We can't rush through because there's no need of studying rain if you don't know what it's really trying to accomplish. What must happen in order for Jesus, our high priest, to win the game after halftime? How many things? Ten things? Two, two great things. Two. Somebody give me one of the two great things that has to happen. The people of God must be brought back to a what? Sinless, Sinless state. That's one. Where was this represented? Where was this represented that he would do this? Where did God represent that he would bring the people of God back to a sinless state? On the Day of Atonement. What part of the Day of Atonement? Beginning of the Day of Atonement, end of the Day of Atonement. So before the Day of Atonement can end, the game can end, it had to be that the congregation, how much? Part of the congregation? Ten? Okay, entire congregation brought to a sinless state. So all of the living had to be brought back to a sinless state. All right. What's the second great thing that has to be uh, done in order for the game to be won? Sister Chanel. So the end time gospel, God's specific gospel message has to go to the where? Where would I find that before the game can come to an end? Where would I find that that has to happen before the game can come to an end? Matthew, Matthew 24, verse 14. Let's say it together. What does it say in verse 14? And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations. And then shall the... So the end of the game, the end of the war can't take place until this special gospel message goes to the entire world. Good. Now, let's read this together. Follow, follow. See if we can find these two points. Christ Object Lessons 120. Christ Object Lessons 120. Let's read this together. It says, Then the glad tidings of a risen Savior were carried to the uttermost bounds of the inhabited world. The church beheld what, everybody? Converts flocking to her from what? So when we follow this plan correctly, we're going to see people coming to the church from all communities, all states, all nations, the world. They're going to be flocking from how many directions? North, south, east, west, from all directions. Let's read together. Believers were reconverted. Sinners united with Christians and seeking the pearl of great price. Every Christian saw in his brother the divine similitude of benevolence and love. Did you find the two points yet? No, no not yet. It says, one interest prevailed. One uh, object swallowed up how many? Oh. So there was one thing that swallowed up everything else. But you're going to find out there's one thing that has two sides. If I take out a coin, one coin, how many sides? Yeah. Two. It says, one interest prevailed, one object swallowed up all others. Let's read it together. All hearts beat in harmony. The only ambition of the believer was to reveal the likeness of Christ's kingdom and to labor for the enlargement of his kingdom. Do we see the two points, yes or no? Yes. What's the first? You said sinless state. Where do I get sinless state? Wait a minute. That doesn't say sinless state. What is that? that says likeness of Christ. How, how do you get sinless out of that? He was tempted in all points like as we are yet without sin. He did no sin. So to be made just like Jesus, to get to know Jesus, it will reflect itself when we're tested that we have victory over every sin. But that's not the only thing that they were interested in internally. There was something they were trying to do externally. Are you following? What were they doing externally? And to what? How far were they to labor? 
the entire world. Now that tells me then, is it enough for us to understand the message in this church? And then be satisfied that we understand and we're getting ready. Is that enough? Once God gives us something, we begin to understand it and begin to enter into it. What should God impress us to do? We've got to spread this to our family, to our churches, to other churches, to the community in which we belong, to the world. We are going to do that by God's grace here. But we've got to follow in the right step. What if somebody tries to take us outside this step and just jump over here and jump to the world? What would you say? You're going too fast. Not even too fast. You're doing the wrong thing. Because if you're doing the thing, you go fast. It's okay if you, go, if you do all the steps. Are you following me? If you make sure you get it, but not the wrong order. That's not going too fast. That's going wrong. So if I go here, I'm doing wrong. You know, you will never be able to help here unless you do something before that. Are you following? What if somebody says, okay, well, if that's what we're going to do, I'm going to immediately then, we'll jump to the state. We'll immediately jump into our community. Do we immediately even jump just to the church? You know what we do first? In our first heart and home, we will say, we're going to do something here. And because we're going to church and we're all doing this, we're saying, Lord, in our own hearts, start this work. Amen. And the only families in which we belong, ask for me and mine. So that's where it starts, but it doesn't end there. That's the beginning, it's not the end. That's the beginning of the end. Are you following? <laughs> then we move over into the church, and this is what we should be spilling out doing right now together. Men should be saying, look, by the grace of God, I want my wives and my children here. Why should be saying, I want my husband and my children here. Family saying, we want to get ready. Where, how can we reach other lost members of the church? We're going to eventually get every name that has ever been a part of this church. And we're going to be able to pray and visit. Or we've been praying for them. We're going to pray and work a plan to reclaim every lost soul. Amen. We're going to work a plan to reach the community right here in Richlands. But we've got to follow first the order. Are you following? Now let's go a little further. This says, uh, likeness of Christ and to labor for the arms of his kingdom. And the Lord added to the church daily such as should be what? The spirit of Christ did what? Animated part of the congregation. The whole congregation. This is what has to happen. His whole church. Now listen to what this says. Christ's object lessons 121. Christ's object lessons 121. Let's read it. These things are to be repeated. That's what has to happen. So that means that we must come back to that sinless state. And even bring it forward that it has never gone before. And we must embelt the world, enlarge the kingdom until it reaches the entire world. It says these things are to be repeated with, and we're, talk to me somebody, greater power. It says the outpouring of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost was the, give me another name, early rain. But the latter rain will be how? More abundant. So it won't be less, it's going to be how? More. It goes on to say. More abundant. Let's read together. It says, The Spirit awaits our demand and reception. Christ is again to be revealed in His fullness. How? By the Holy Spirit. I want to ask you a question. Does the Bible identify the time when the Pentecost is going to be repeated? Does the Bible identify that time? Yes or no? Yes. Where would I go in the Bible to see the time repeated where thousands are going to be converted in a day, just like on Pentecost, but with greater power? Where would I find that time frame? So you, say, you say what, please? Ezekiel 10, in, in, in symbolic form, but, but I, mean in, 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 I mean we're specifically, directly talking about that first and foremost. Now, it is so in type in Ezekiel 10. But it is, that's not the first application. But in the first application, where do we find that actually happening? Revelation 18, yes! Revelation, the what chapter? Let's go there. Let's go to Revelation 18. Now, we're going to study this more in detail in the future, not, to, not today. Let's go to Revelation 18, but we want to touch it today. Go to Revelation 18. Revelation 18. Now, notice what happens in Revelation 18, verse 1. Revelation 18, verse 1. What does the Bible say in verse 1? All together, it says, And after these things, I saw, what? Another angel come down from heaven, having what? Now, remember, it says that the things that be repeated, and with, talk to me, greater power. So here's an angel or a messenger coming down with greater power and it says, and how much? What, what happened? What did he do? Talk to me. Earth. And the earth was what? Lightened with his glory. So if the whole earth was lightened with his glory, that meant how much of the world did he reach? Everybody. So this angel accomplishes the work that will allow the game of life to be won. Are you following? Yes or no? He reaches the entire world. Now, and with this light, we don't have time to study, but this angel has victory over sin. The, the text itself shows that when you study it. But now listen, 
What does he do in verse 2? In verse 2, let's read that. Uh, Sister Minnie, would you read Revelation 18, verse 2, please? And he cried mightily with a strong Let me stop you right there for a moment. He did what? Cry. He didn't whisper. He didn't laugh. He did what? Cry. He cried mightily. mightily with a strong voice. Now, if I say something is strong, now let, let me illustrate. Am I speaking with a strong voice? No. Brother Smokey? Brother Smokey! <laughs> Which one was strong voice? So when you say strong voice, what do you mean? Loud. So when the Bible says he cried mightily with a strong voice, what does it mean? He gave a loud cry. Now, in fact, in the original language, that word strong comes from a word that means that comes from a Greek word that's called megas. It's called what? Now, a person go to McDonald's, he says, I want a mega burger, you know, a mega fries. What does he mean by mega? And what, now, if you go to McDonald's, and you're not going to McDonald's, but somebody else is going to McDonald's and they brought and they've got a mega, a mega burger with a mega fries. And somebody came out and brought him this little patty. <laughs> what would he say? I didn't order. I ordered a mega. So that's a mini, not a mega. That's a mini and not just a mini. <laughs> so mega, mega means what? Large. So if you're dealing with size, it's largeness. But if you're dealing with volume, it's what? So it says he cried with a mega voice. So it's dealing with vi volume, audible. So really, the Bible is saying he cried with a loud cry. So, so what the Bible is telling us, he cried. So if he cried, it was a what? Loud cry. So Revelation 18 shows us that the loud cry is what actually finishes the work and repeats what happened on Pentecost. Are we together? Right. Let's read this again. Christ's Revelation 121. We'll come back to Revelation 18. It says, these things are to be repeated and with greater power, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost was the former rain, but the latter rain will be what? Talk to me. More it's going to reach the entire world. We found out what the shadow said and we brought back to this place. We looked at this. Now, in a game, there's something called, do you see this what, right there? Yeah. Two, Two minute, minute warning. warning. Now, that was a movie that they made based on the real thing. Something in football uh, called the Two Minute Warning. From the encyclopedia, it says, from the 1976 film Two Minute Warning in the National Football League, the two minute warning is given when what? Two, two minutes of game time remain on the game clock in each half of a game near the what? End of the second and the Now we know that the end of that game finished. 31 AD, the first half. So in the second half of the game, what will happen before the game comes to an end in football? There's something called the what? Now when the two minute warning is blown, and the whistle blew, and the whistle goes off, what happens? What, 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 is that? what does everybody know? They know the clock stops and they know that the game is what? Almost over. Now, my teacher used to speak of this. He used to love football before he was converted. And what he started talking about was something in Bible prophecy called the two minute warning of Bible prophecy. The what? Two, two minute. minute now, I'm telling you right now, we are in the final two minute warning of the game of life right now. Now, listen, when they, if, if, if you were down and the two minute warning goes off and the, and the whistles go and your teams stop and they go back to the huddles, if you were the coach talking to your team players, at the two-minute warning, what do you say? Continue to do like you've been doing the whole game. You're down by 15. Do you say continue to do like you've been doing the whole game? No. If you're the coach, what do you say? <laughs> stop, stop playing. Now, I know you're playing the game, but stop playing. We got to get into this thing. Are you following? If you are the uh, winning team, if you're up at that time, there are strategies that you put in place at the two-minute warning either to keep you ahead or if you are ahead, to run the clock so that you stay ahead and win the game. Am I right? right. The same is true in any game. Basketball, same time. They don't, they don't have what is two-minute warning, but they do have the same concept near the end of the game. And you go down, you call that timeout, you say, look, we got we to win this game. I'm going to tell you something. Satan understands something. Satan understands that in the two-minute warning, that if he could hold us the same way we are right now, he wins. There was a game, though, that I told you about that I hated. Remember I told you about this game? It was the New York Knicks basketball. I, I said I wasn't too deeply into football. I saw it, I knew it, and I watched it. But I wasn't. But, but I was really into basketball. 
And this is the game. This is, this is the complete coverage of the 20th anniversary of Reggie Miller's eight points in nine seconds. This is probably the most unbelievable game ever played. Now, here's a quick history of the game. You, you weren't there, so let me give you a history of the game. It was 20 years ago in Madison Square Garden. I remember the day. That Miller and the Indiana Pacers poured off an improbable 107-105 victory against the New York Knicks in game one of the Eastern Conference semifinals. It was, as Miller recalls, the perfect storm. <laughs> Eight points, nine seconds. A lot of things had to happen for us to what? Now, see, you understand this? For the seven minutes to church to win, a lot of things had to happen. A lot of little things that will make the two things happen. So there's a lot of little things and we got to go through the, the things that have to happen in order for us to win because we've got to win. Are you following? Yes. It says eight points, nine seconds. How did it happen? That was the spotlight time in, 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 in what was 18.7 seconds of what? Chaos. The Knicks led. Now look, guess this. Watch. The Knicks, the Knicks led at what? 105 to 99. Now remember, watch now. There was 18 seconds left and the New York Knicks are up. 105 to 99. You think game is over? 18 seconds? I remember. I thought the game was in the middle. Minute before, I'm, the game is in the bag. I'm like, I'm like, <laughs> you know, they used to do a song. Na, 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 na. Hey. Now, you remember? So it said, the Knicks led. The Pacers, Mark Jackson, inbounded the ball. Reggie gets the pass. Catches. Turns. Fire. Boom. Three points. Just like that. Guarding Reggie's nemesis, John Starks. Oh. <laughs> Standing in front of his front row seat is noted filmmaker uh, uh, Spike Lee. Spike Lee is always in every New York Geeks game fan. He hated Miller. Miller hated him. There was a rivalry, but it's a whole other story. And it says, well, Miller has had shall say uh, spirited dialogue with Miller smack in the middle of his two main guarding adversaries. And Miller was prideful. Yes, he was. Miller talked trash. The ball hits the middle of the basket, nothing but net. Now, what happened? 105 to 102, because remember, three points happened. How much seconds left? 16. You say, well, st the st game's still in the back, 16 seconds. It says, all of a sudden, Anthony Mason, he was a forward, then tried to inbound for the Knicks, who had no times out remaining, but Greg Anthony slips, point guard. Reggie says with a laugh, you know, in other words, Reggie Miller would do some tricky things. So sometimes while the coach is looking, referee is looking the other way, boom, he not, not, So he, he laughs because when he tripped, he, he gave one of his little moves. Reggie says with a laugh, Miller fires in front of the filmmaker again. In other words, as he trips, slips, the ball gets back into the hand of the uh, uh, Indiana Pacers. Reggie Miller gets it, and from long distance, another three point. Boom, nothing. Slip, Miller fires in front of the uh, filmmaker again, good again. 105 to 105, and guess what? Only 13 seconds left. Only a few seconds pass. The Knicks inbound, and Sam Mitchell surprisingly fouled Starks. Now, Starks, this man had a, had a shot. 73% free, free throw shooter, Starks misses both of them. I'm saying, <laughs> Ewing, center, Patrick Ewing, tapping the rebound to himself, missing, and Miller gets the rebound. How does Miller get the rebound? And then Mason surprisingly fouls Miller. How do you foul Miller? With 7.5 left, Reggie hits both of them. Indiana, and there you have it, eight points in what? Nine seconds. Can you understand how the people who left the stadium believing that they, they won? Some people thought it was all over, but it wasn't over yet. Now, do you understand right now, Satan believes that he has God, his back against the wall. He feels like he has a seven of in his church in the bang because so many of us are ignorant of the truth and the message. He knows that. Look, look at how we're sinning. How are we going to talk about some sinless state when what we're doing every day? What's happening every week? And so he's saying, look, they, I'm not worried about them. How are we going to win the game like that? Now, my brothers and sisters, but he does not understand that God is about. You got to, you know, you, you have to dr bring the drama for the Lord. You, you get, God is about. You say, what is he about? You do. You <laughs> He's about to upset the devil in the game of life in the final generation. He's going to do something. Now, remember, every team has a strategy. I want you to remember this. You may not understand it yet, but I want you to remember this that further later in our studies will flesh out. 
Satan's strategy to keep the seven Adventist church down so we do not come to the place where we can finish the work and win the game. Satan's strategy has a name, has a what? What is the name of this strategy? The name is called. If you were blessed by this study and would like to be a part of the BTI Vets Bible Training Institute, simply have your Bible pen and paper handy and check out our weekly studies by logging on to molministry.com. Hover over sermons, then from the drop down, click the word video. Also, tune in every Friday at 10 a.m. Eastern Standard Time for the latest. Maranatha.